Sri Mohan Das Pai was a member of the board of directors of Infosys and head of various departments like Administration, Education and Research, Finical, Human Resources and Infosys Leadership Institute. He has been active in working with regulators to improve the business ecosystem. He has a keen interest in improving literacy across the country, mainly primary education. In 2000, he along with others founded the Akshay Patra Foundation Bangalore to start a midday meal program for school children. Today, the midday meal program feeds over 12 lakh children in uh, about uh, 7,600 government schools across seven states in India. He is currently the director of Manipal Universal Learnings Private Limited. Welcome to you, sir. It might surprise many of you to know that in 1750, India and China made up 45. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I seem to have got a throat problem. India and China made up about 45% of the world GDP. It is only colonial rule and the taking away of India's resources, which Will Durant recounts in his book, The Case for India, that allowed the West to dominate. And with the West domination came this story about universalization, or universalism, like Rajiv says, and patronage, and the West's need to assimilate various civilizations into the West's point of view. And today, as we stand here in this decade, we're going to see an extraordinary event happen in this decade. The world GDP today is about $60 trillion. The United States is 15, Europe is 15, Japan is 5, the rest of the emerging markets is about 25. With China and India growing at 7 to 9%, this decade we'll see after about 260 years, the rise of the emerging markets overtaking the OECD. And the OECD, that means that in this year, in this decade, the entire emerging markets, the countries outside of OECD, will have a larger GDP than the OECD. OECD is essentially Europe and America. And the decade following this decade, 2020-2030, we're going to see the share of the emerging markets double again based upon economic growth. And this means the balance of economic power is going to change. And India is already the third largest economy in, in terms of PPP, but India will be the third largest economy in nominal terms, possibly in 20 years. The old domination of the West by their ascent on the Western way of life, Western philosophy, and the Western view of things over the East and over the rest of the world, and the spirit of uni unilateral activism that they had is coming to an end in economic terms. The economic upsurge in the West caused by the Industrial Revolution allows them to dominate world thought and create a homogeneity in world culture which was destructive. And if you study Western history, you find the largest destruction of indigenous people, the mass killing of many, many civilizations happened in that time in the last 250 years, which was possibly the only occasion when it happened, except when Genghis Khan started his conquest across Asia many, many centuries before that. So now in this decade, when the time comes, when the emerging people, the emerging markets, people of possibly three-fifths of humanity or four-fifths of humanity are going to come into the own, it's important for all of us to assert that we are different, that the world is not a homogeneous place, the world has immense diversity, diversity caused by civilization, diversity caused by thought, and we must cherish and protect this diversity and ensure that this diversity is put before everybody else so there is peace and harmony. But at the heart of this homogeneity is the debate between people of the book and the people who don't have a book. Because the people of the book claim superiority based upon holy revelation. They claim superiority based on the fact that there is a God and it is their God and there's only one way to go to heaven and that is to worship that God. And if you don't, you're condemned as an infidel or as a heathen who will not go to heaven. And we, being part of the Asian civilization, are certainly not going to that heaven. But the very question of that heaven is getting redefined. Because the heaven is not the American way of life, but the heaven is a new way of life which belongs to people in Asia. And that is the essential difference in terms of the economic transformation that is happening. And that is why I feel personally Rajiv's book is a very important contribution to this debate for the people of the world to reclaim their identity, to reclaim their being different, to reclaim what they are, the historicity of the civilization, and to stand up and to be counted and take pride in themselves. 
At the end of the Second World War, before the Korea started to fight again, mm. you know, South Korea was a Buddhist republic, was a Buddhist country. But in 20 years, Buddhism came down from about 90% of the faith to something like 15%. Because the Koreans felt that they were a failed civilization. They were a poor people and success was the West. And the West had a superior religion. The West had a superior practice. So they embraced change. You know, change happened because evangelical movement that came out from America. And the change happened because of sense of superiority. And this is what we as Indian people need to guard about at this critical point of time where we see this change. So we need to study our own history. We need to assert our identity as individuals who are inheritors of a great civilization, a civilization which allowed the concept of liberty to flourish, a civilization that allowed each individual to choose his own path. Now the concept of each individual choosing his own path is an unbelievable concept because the concept itself defines freedom. And freedom is very critical to the human mind, the spirit of inquiry that you people seek here in this institution. And that freedom must be preserved because the, I, the idea of a monotheistic religion, the idea of one way of life is the antithesis of human freedom. Humans get into bondage because of this huge organization that, support, that supports and drives this drive towards homogeneity. And that's what we need to put it against. And that's why to me, Rajiv Malhotra's book is extremely important for those of us in India and elsewhere in the world. I would like to end with another point which I want to make emphatically here. <clears throat> the, the people of the book and the people who believe in revelations believe that they have a holy right and a holy, let us say, imperative to conquer nature. And the conquest of nature implies the destruction of nature in its myriad form and the use of the natural resources for improvement in the so-called quality of life. And the destructive ability of this drive to conquer and the, and the feeling that they are born to conquer, they have a divine right to conquer and they cannot go wrong, has led to many wars. We have seen that, has led to slavery. We have seen that, has led to colonial domination and the white man's burden. We have seen that. But it's leading to another dangerous consequences, an attack on the planet, an attack on natural resources, an attack on what nature has given us. Now, in our Dhami civilization and in Indic civilization, I would like to believe that we have to live at harmony with nature, respecting the right of every single item of iota of life, whether it's a plant or, a, or any animal or origin or whatever it is, to survive and to grow. Because you believe everything has a right to live. Because you believe in the diversity of life. But if when you believe in one way of life, you are going to be destructive. And that destructive feeling is hurting, hurting the planet, is hurting the place where all of us live. So it's up to us to stand up and to assert that even we believe in a, in a theory that individuals have a right to look out of themselves, we should believe in the theory of sustainability, that we have to live in harmony with nature, and it implies that nature has a right to a free existence as an individualistic existence and not necessarily subservient to man. Now, unless you come to this philosophy, we're going to live in a planet which is going to diminish and we're all going to be victims of this drive towards homogeneity. I would like to end here by saying that in all this debate, we should take an intellectual viewpoint of what Raji Malhotra has said. And it's important for us in asserting our individuality and in asserting our right to be different that we do not cast aspersions on somebody else and deny them the right to be different. While we must assert our right to be different, and we should as independent people, we must not deny the right to be different to somebody else and for somebody else to follow their own path. It means there must be no hatred on our part. There must be no negative assertion. There must be a positive assertion and mutual respect for the other's right to exist, whatever be the tradition. And that is there in our Indian tradition. Because in our religion, even being a heretic, being an atheist is acceptable. It's part of the debate. It's part of what you are. And we respect people who are atheists. And this respect for the other should be carried forward because it's only in this intellectual debate will we find the meaning of life. After all, our journey in life is to understand the meaning of life and the reason for existence. And I believe unless we inquire, we will never be able to find the reason for our existence. And the reasons for the existence of each individual is going to be very different. So thank you, Raji, for everything that you've done with this. I think it's an extremely important contribution at this critical juncture when the world is changing. Thank you very much.